And good morning, everybody, uh, Minister, distinguished guests, and Ambassador from Australia. Um, I see I have about minus four minutes to complete my presentation, so I'll be rather quick. Um, and 20 also, minutes. 20 minutes, yeah. <laughs> and also, just to be, to be clear, um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, of course, but I did not fly here for this conference. Um, I've, I was in Europe. I would hate to see the headlines saying, you know, in the midst of economic crisis, New Zealand government representative flies to Ireland for one day conference on climate change. So, uh, very happy to be here. I'll get into it. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to give you a background on New Zealand agriculture, the context for agriculture. Uh, I'll then go through the, uh, the situation with regards to greenhouse gas emissions. Very quickly go over the policy framework that we currently have, um, and then talk a bit more about the research and some of the, I guess, more fundamental aspects of mitigating greenhouse gases in the livestock agricultural sector. <clears throat> so enough about Ireland, let's look at New Zealand. Uh, we're a land-based economy. Uh, we have about 11 million hectares of uh, land and grazing livestock production. That's about half of our land area. Livestock are grazed outdoors year-round in New Zealand, and uh, grass is the, is the main diet of our livestock, whether it be grazed fresh or once, once it's been turned into uh, hay or silage. <coughs> we have about 40 million sheep, about 5 million, um, just over 5 million dairy cattle, 4.5 million beef cattle, 1.5 million farmed deer, which would be rather unique, uh, and about 33 million lambs, which are often forgotten. Every year we have 33 million lambs coming and going. We produce about 40% of the world's traded dairy products. Uh, I think we're the largest dairy exporter in the world. We produce, um, was it 60, can't read this, 66% of traded lamb. And agriculture represents just over half of our export earnings. So it's absolutely vital to our economy. Now, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, this is the latest inventory information from New Zealand. And as you can see here, um, our total emissions, excluding LULUCF, are 77.9 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. Uh, LULUCF represents quite a significant sink of carbon, or did in the inventory year that's represented here. And this, of course, changes over time as trees are harvested and replanted. But in terms of agriculture, you can see it's almost half of our annual emissions. 37.7 million tonnes, and probably 98% of this would be from livestock. At least 98% would be from livestock, grazing livestock. Primarily dairy, sheep and beef, which would make up roughly 60% um, probably from dairy and around you know, almost 40% from sheep and beef, and the remainder would be the other minor species, horses, um, deer, pigs, etc., chickens. We are unique for a developed country. Um, as has already been said a few times today, Ireland is our closest uh, friend or ally in this, in this respect, but of course many developing countries face a very similar situation to, to us with, I think on average, about 27% of emissions in developing countries come from the agricultural sector. <clears throat> That's only an annual uh, look at our emissions. Uh, in terms of the trends in New Zealand and our commitments under the Kyoto Protocol, we have a target of 90-90 um, levels of emissions over the first commitment period. Uh, or, of course, take responsibility for the excess above this. And in New Zealand's situation, there will be an excess. Uh, we have had an increase of 26% uh, since 1990. And as part of this, the agricultural sector has increased 16% since 1990. And enteric fermentation has increased about 11%. And emissions from agricultural soils about 27%, which has been driven largely by uh, increased fertiliser use, and also the increase in dairying within New Zealand over, uh, since 1990. There's been quite significant restructurings in the agricultural sector in New Zealand due to the elimination of subsidies in the mid-1980s. And this has meant that the sheep population has roughly halved and the dairy population has almost doubled in that time. So it's been quite significant for, uh, for the economy but also for greenhouse gases. Um, I must also stress that at the same time as we've seen an increase in absolute emissions, we have also seen a decrease in emissions per unit output. And this has been around 1%, 1.5% per year, improving the intensity of emissions, um, due primarily to animals producing more per head, uh, more milk, et cetera, and also lambing percentages increasing and the, the, the weights of lambs um, increasing. Now, in terms of the policies, um, <laughs> we had an election uh, in November. And leading up to the election, there was a very, very large emphasis on emissions trading, and legislation was passed before the election. Uh, we still have an emissions trading scheme in New Zealand, but there has, 
a, a parliamentary review process has been instigated, which is, is beginning now and is, I think, set to finish around September this year. We also have a sustainable land management and climate change plan of action, which is really the sort of framework that the emissions trading scheme works within with respect to the land-based sectors anyway. Um, so I'll just quickly go over the emissions trading scheme and just remember that what I talk about is where we got to prior to this review process beginning and uh, everything is subject to change. In terms of the emissions trading scheme overall, it's an economy-wide, all sectors, all gases emissions trading scheme, which we believe is the only of its type, or plan to be the only of its type in the world. Sectors phase in over time. The forestry sector was uh, entering from the 1st of January this year, sorry, 2008, and agriculture from the 1st of January 2013. The units of trade are New Zealand units, and all New Zealand units are backed by assigned amount units that New Zealand government receives uh, as part of its allocation under the Kyoto Protocol. What this means is that participants in the New Zealand emissions trading scheme can trade uh, between themselves or internationally because every New Zealand unit is backed by a, a Kyoto compliant unit. So on, uh, when an, a participant in the New Zealand emissions trading scheme wishes to trade internationally, they go through the New Zealand registry and the units are replaced with uh, Kyoto compliant units. Basically, participants report their emissions and surrender units equal to those emissions uh, at each compliance period. The, the compliance, um, the, the way we've handled compliance is much like our tax system. We're not checking every individual participant, but there are severe penalties for non-compliance and we're just relying on the, the threat, I guess, of imprisonment or large, large fines for non-compliance, much like our tax system. Um, there is allocation to sectors that are most affected and these allocations are, at least in the default in the legislation, are to be phased out over time. And again, all of these design elements are subject to the current review process. Just to move to the agricultural sector and look at this and some of the issues we've been exploring here, um, and the two key ones, I guess, point of obligation and alloc allocation. In terms of the point of obligation, the default in the legislation was set at the company or processor level. This minimises the number of participants in the scheme. It also captures a large proportion of the agricultural sector's emissions. Uh, we have you know, relatively few companies or processes operating in New Zealand um, with you know, one major, major dairy company and a couple of other, or maybe two or three now, smaller dairy companies, and a relatively small number of meat processes, and really only two major fertiliser companies. So with you know, a relatively small number of participants, you can capture the agricultural sector's emissions. Um, farm level obligation is also an option, and we're looking in great detail at this. Of course, this takes some time to implement, and there are a lot of a lot of technical issues to, to be um, worked through. Um, it would, of course, improve the incentives because the price signal is actually at the land owner or stock owner level. And that is the individual who has the greatest control over their operations. So ultimately, that would be their desired approach, but it just takes time to get there, I think, and would, of course, potentially increase the costs of, of compliance or the cost of the whole scheme. In terms of allocation, um, in the legislation, the agricultural sector is to be allocated 90% of 2005 level of emissions. And this is to be phased out between 2018 and 2030, which is that graph on the, on the screen there. And it's a rather scary picture when you talk to the industry, when they see that phase out going to zero. Um, and again, this is the default legislation, and this would be reviewed in accordance with the international obligations New Zealand has, in accordance with other international action being undertaken. and assessing the risks or the exposure of the sector to competitiveness at risk uh, issues. Uh, and also really to, to avoid the, the likelihood of regrets for a major structural change within New Zealand that may not have to happen in the, sh in the short term. You know, if in 10 or 20 years time solutions came about for, for mitigation or other, other countries, uh, economies placed a price on agricultural emissions which, re which removed that competitiveness issue. How the, how the allocation is, um, distributed within the agricultural sector has yet to be established. So how the dairy or the sheep or the beef or the dairy sector's received allocation has yet to be, has yet to be established. And this will be a, uh, an interesting discussion because some sectors have increased since 1990, or some sub-sectors, and some have decreased since 1990. So it will be an interesting one. The, the forestry aspects of the emissions trading scheme I've also included in this presentation. It's, it's very important for New Zealand. And, in the absence of mitigation technologies in the short term, of course, forestry is very important for land-based uh, activities, agricultural sector, and 
Um, in the legislation, we have forestry included from the start of 2008, start of the Kyoto Protocol, and this includes <coughs> all new forests and all deforestation activities. So all post-1989 forests, or A&R forests, afforestation and reforestation forests, have the opportunity to claim the credits and the liabilities that go with those forests. Um, the obligations will rest with the landowners and bind future landowners once they've entered the scheme. And all uh, forest owners would receive New Zealand units. Of course, can, they can be converted to Kyoto compliant units for international trading. I've already mentioned the importance of forestry for agricultural offsetting. And that, you know, there is significant land area in New Zealand able to be planted. Um, we've done some work which suggests perhaps up to a million hectares is, is suitable for, for afforestation, uh, relatively low, product, low, low productivity, um, erosion prone land. Now, deforestation is also uh, included because Due to the, I guess, the international commodity prices, um, dairy farming being quite favourable, at least has been in the last few years, there's been quite a lot of plantation forestry that has been cleared in New Zealand and turned into dairy farming. Now, arguably from an uh, sort of economic perspective, this is absolutely rational and, and wonderful, but from a Kyoto Protocol perspective, this creates huge liabilities. So we have included this in the emissions trading scheme, so all of these landowners who convert even though they are plantation forests, convert these forests to pastoral land, will face the liabilities or the majority of the liabilities of this activity. There is an allocation to um, these forests to account for some of the land adjustment, the land value adjustment that has occurred due to this rule. Um, and you know we are working very, very um, hard in the international negotiations for post-2012 to ensure that maybe some of these rules don't apply from 2013 onwards because they make little sense to us. Um, when you can re-establish a forest uh, somewhere else as potentially an offset for this, for this sort of activity. The, the other major policy emphasis, and I could talk for probably an hour on this alone, um, but I won't, <laughs> um, is the Sustainable Land Management uh, and Climate Change Plan of Action. Now this is a inv total investment of about 175 million over the next five years in the land-based sectors, and this is including livestock, also horticultural production, forestry. It is based around three pillars, adaptation, mitigation, and business opportunities. <coughs> adaptation, of course, uh, is, is vitally important in, this, in the climate change um, context. Uh, for New Zealand, we, at a national level, we don't fare too, too badly in the short term, but within New Zealand, there are some regional, regional issues and, and things like droughts on the east coast of New Zealand, increased rainfall where we really don't need it on the west coast, and uh, the, the sort of greater frequency of extreme events floods, snow events, out of season, I guess out of season weather is the key thing for us. Um, so this is a five year plan of action that's been developed for adaptation. All of these pillars are being developed and all of the, all of the policy around them has been developed with very close cooperation with the agricultural sector, with the local government authorities in New Zealand and with Maori representation. Uh, and this is a very important aspect of this policy development that we take the sectors right along with us and in fact they have a, a rather large uh, input into the design of the policy, so it actually makes sense on the ground. Within mitigation, there's the, of course the emissions trading side of things. There's a large emphasis on research. There's also um, a grant scheme for forestry, much like the, uh, the forestry grants you, you run here in Ireland, which um, provides money to establish established new forests, which the credits and liabilities would remain in the, the Crown accounts. Um, and the, the sort of the gearing for those grants is based on the co-benefits of, of those forests and, and the benefits they deliver. And the business opportunity side of things, it's really trying to look at um, some of the, the sort of positives that climate change and the, and the carbon market can bring for an, a land-based economy and looking at the voluntary market, uh, looking at some of the ideas around differentiating production or products in the, in the international marketplace, carbon footprinting, etc. Um, and we've got a large investment in this area also. Um, as I've mentioned, research is a, is a major part, and this is one of the, the supporting, I guess, cross-cutting issues, the research and innovation, the technology transfer and information, and the communications and engagement, which cuts right through all of these pillars. Now, to turn to the, I guess, more fundamentals of mitigation for a moment, um, irrespective of any policy, you need good information. Uh, and when it comes to the agricultural sector, this is particularly important. So, in terms of look, I guess the three components of this information, you have the laboratory and the science, the basic science, you have the field and the farm, and then you have the, sort of at the national level, how we implement these things. I just want to give people an idea of 
you know, some of the issues around mitigation, it's not as simple as it may seem. Um, and in, in terms of the role of the science, you, we need to develop an understanding of the basics of biological systems and understand the interactions between the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. We then need to get an idea of what this means for greenhouse gas emissions, which isn't always clear, and develop good nationally appropriate emissions factors for nitrous oxide, for methane, based on the soils and the climate data and the, and the nature of the systems in each country. We, of course, also need to develop mitigation options based on what we know about the basic science. Uh, and you know, an awful lot of work has been done at the very fundamental level, looking at the mi microbes uh, within, the, within animals and uh, the role of soil and treatment of soil that can reduce emissions. But this is all in the lab. Then you take it to the field on the farm and you say, how does this, this new idea fit within a, within a field or within the farm? So you need to evaluate these options within a whole farm system. And you know, although experimentally you might have 50%, 70% reduction <coughs> shown when you take it to a farm situation, when you have all the interactions with climate and soil and and human behaviour and animals walking around, uh, these, these percentages can be reduced quite dramatically. You need to think about what the, what the mitigation option uh, does to productivity. And if it, if it just removes all productivity or stops the animal eating grass, then it's not very viable. Um, the, the farmers need to be, um, be, be able to implement these, these options. They need to understand um, how they work and make the necessary adjustments in the farming system, whether that be implementing the option within the system or making changes to the system itself. But these are not, these are not easy changes to make. Uh, and when this is a business relying you know, year round on production, uh, these, are, these are not sort of simple, uh, quick decisions. They need to be uh, based on solid information. Then at the national level, to actually make this count in the Kyoto Protocol books so that the government can actually show a reduction of greenhouse gases, we need to aggregate all of this information together in the inventory. So we need to aggregate all estimates from all sources of greenhouse gases. We need to aggregate all of the activity data, so all of the animal numbers, modelling all the population flows throughout the year. We also need to aggregate all the mitigation activities that have taken place. So how many farms used a nitrification inhibitor? How many farmers fed their animals a different type of feed? Et cetera, et cetera. But differentiating the different fertiliser types. We then need to put this all into an annual national inventory. And then, we, of course, we need to think about the appropriate policy design at the national level, how to, how to implement these policies. So, you know, it's a complicated picture, um, and it really relies on good information right at the outset, irrespective of whether we have emissions trading or regulations or what have you. So, in this respect, the investment in New Zealand in research has been quite substantial over the last number of years. Uh, within my ministry, we've invested, uh, as part of the plan of action, we'll invest about 40 million over the next five years in in this area. Mitigation research, um, looking at rumen function, nitrous oxide emission estimates, even developing urine sensors to try and estimate the quantum and the concentration of nitrogen within urine out on the field, looking at novel mitigation approaches, some of the sort of, um, I guess, snake oil salesmen that come up to you and talk to you, you know, can you actually evaluate these, uh, these ideas and, and see whether they have some credibility? Um, looking at the role of soil in actually oxidising methane. Um, Another part of the, the money is spent on developing an inventory, so we actually can turn these options and practices into real numbers. And this is, of course, all around good practice of inventory design, getting good handle on our projections of emissions, a modelling that goes into inventory, and reviewing emissions factors so that they actually can stand up internationally to, this, to uh, international review. We, um, we also have money invested in monitoring and measuring farm emissions and mitigation. Now, this is built on the, uh, a nutrient budget model called Overseer, which uh, was developed by, uh, by my ministry, by uh, a number of players in New Zealand, for fertiliser, effectively. Um, and much of the information you need to develop a nutrient budget uh, can, can basically give you your greenhouse gas emissions at the farm level. So we're looking at turning Overseer into a greenhouse gas uh, tool at the farm level, which in the event of emissions trading, where the point of obligation was at the farm level, would be a very useful tool and would avoid duplication and creating new tools um, given that many farmers are familiar with overseer at the moment. Technology transfer is another, another bu uh, big area that we're looking at, um, demonstrating these practices to farmers using the existing farm monitoring programs that exist within the dairy industry, within the sheep and beef industry, um, and also building on our sustainable farming fund which is a, a bottom-up uh, fund that we run in our ministry and we've created a new climate change aspect to this where Projects can be developed from community groups um, and farmer groups and proposed to the ministry for, for funding. Typically these are sort of 
two to three year projects. We also have a greenhouse gas footprint strategy, um, which is, uh, I guess the emergence of this was the food miles discussions that have happened for a number of years and saying that if it comes from New Zealand, it's bad because it's you know, traveled 12,000 miles. Um, and our response to that was, well, obviously, no, it's not, um, because you need to look at the whole system. And of course, where we're going now is the, the idea of retailers actually putting labels on products. So, you know, we, we believe we're in a very um, strong position with the, with the work we've done to date, and we're continuing this work uh, with our sectors. And we have, um, we have projects underway on dairy, lamb, kiwi fruit, wine, forestry, onions, and berry fruit. And I understand beef and dairy is also, is also on the cards in the next year or so. Uh, and this is really to develop um, methodologies and uh, footprint approaches that are consistent with all of the international standards, but also make sense for us um, so that the scope is correct for, for pastoral uh, agriculture in New Zealand. Uh, another major component of the research in New Zealand, which is actually led by the industry, and this is 50-50 funded between government and industry, and this is the Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium. Um, and it's a collaboration of science, farming and business op businesses operating within the, uh, within the agricultural sector. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. I mean, there's a lot of work they're doing. That they're looking at evaluating forages, the microbes. They're looking at work on vaccination for methane reduction, looking at whether you can breed, breed low emission animals. Um, and this is entering its second phase of research. There's been uh, the five year first stage and now the second stage is underway and they're spending about 25 million over the next five years uh, on this. And we also have a, an international, um, I guess, steering group or um, strategy group that, that assists the PGGRC in developing its research priorities. And uh, I'm, I think a, an Irish scientist is on that group, Mr. Frank Amara. Um, another important aspect of, of the sector for us on the research side of things is international cooperation. You know, while, while greenhouse gas emissions from, from agriculture in New Zealand are 50%, uh, I've also said that developing countries and other countries have a large share of their emissions from agriculture, and many developing countries are around 50%, and I think Uruguay is actually 85% of their emissions are from, from agriculture. So there's an interest in the other, you know, the developing countries uh, to find solutions and, and build understanding of, of how to reduce these emissions. So. We set up the Learn Network in the end of 2007, and the genesis of this actually was um, from a New Zealand and Irish um, collaboration in the middle of 2007, where we held a couple of side events at the Bonn Climate Change Meeting, and we a side event, uh, for those who aren't aware of the process, is, is really just a, sort of a couple of hours of presentations and discussion where we focused on agriculture, and, and you know, it's quite a rare, rare event to have a side event on agriculture within the discussions in, in the UNFCCC. <laughs> And it attracted a lot of interest, and we realised there was enough interest there to warrant, you know, making a more formal uh, network to create more opportunities to discuss this issue. So we established the Learn Network. We had the inaugural meeting in New Zealand in the end of 2007 uh, on the back of a major greenhouse gas animal agriculture conference, the next one of which is in Canada in tw uh, 2010. And so far we've had uh, three workshops through Learn. We've had one on plant breeding, look at the looking at the role of uh, breeding plants for adaptation and for mitigation. Uh, we've, we've had one in Uruguay looking at greenhouse gas measurement and mitigation in grazing livestock systems. There was one recently in Peru looking at the um, Andean systems um, and the specific nature of those systems and the challenges of them. And we have one planned for March this year on livestock breeding to mitigate enteric fermentation. And I understand a number of Irish scientists will also come to that down in New Zealand. Um, we also set up a Learn Fellowship program in the middle of last year, and this was to provide opportunities for uh, scientists from developing countries to come to New Zealand and work within our institutes for short-term short work placements in the hope that we created stronger scientific um, <coughs> um, relationships through that, but also built capacity within developing countries rather than just um, employ developing country scientists within New Zealand, which we've also done quite a lot of in recent, uh, in recent times because there's not too many scientists in the world who actually understand this stuff. And I think between New Zealand, Australia and Ireland, there's probably most of the world's expertise, to be honest, in, the, in this area. Um, there's a website for the, for the uh, Learn Network, which is pretty hard to see on the screen, but livestockemissions.net. And my final slide, might just on time. Um, just to conclude, um, you know, like I've said, the technical challenge for effective mitigation of livestock greenhouse gas emissions are still significant. You know, we're a long way off to actually eliminating emissions. 
but we can make reductions, we can make improvements. And as already been said, there are opportunities within nitrous oxide to, to reduce emissions. And we are quite confident with uh, one technology, nitrification inhibitors, that we think can deliver benefits. And indeed, we're including it in our greenhouse gas inventory next time around. And some of these solutions are advanced experimentally, but they need to be verified uh, in different physical and environmental conditions and at the national level. And of course, around the world. Um, in some respects, there's no point reducing New Zealand's emissions to zero in agriculture if they go up everywhere else. We need to find solutions that can be applied universally, or as much as possible universally. So research is a high priority for us. But given the projected increase in demand for livestock products out to 2050, with the world population increasing by another 50%, research needs to be prioritised internationally if we're going to succeed and if the agricultural sector is actually going to play a meaningful contribution in mitigating greenhouse gases uh, and the mitigation of climate change. You know, the expectations on the agricultural sector and what the sector can deliver in the short term need to be, to be understood as well. And emissions from the sector will not go down in the short term, that is quite clear. So we just need to make the best of that and, and produce food as efficiently as we possibly can. But that can only be done with international cooperation. Uh, in terms of policy approaches, Farmer buy-in is absolutely critical. Um, we've been through consultations for the last probably seven years in New Zealand and there's been some very heated discussions uh, and bringing people along with you in, in the development of policy is extremely important and we've done that with the plan of action and you know, we're confident that we can, uh, we can I guess, tackle the challenges we have in New Zealand with half of the emissions from agriculture. Uh, and it's going to be painful for some but I think you know, overall um, everyone's on the same page at the moment. Um, and you know, ultimately, like the EU um, emissions trading, the new, the new bill has recognised, we need to address competitiveness issues and leakage. And we also need to address the inability to pass on costs to consumers at this point in time when you have less than, less than complete coverage. There simply isn't any way for exporters like us to pass on the cost <coughs> to the consumer. Um, you know, and there's, there's movement in the, in the retail sectors around labelling and things, which I think you know, is useful, but it's only useful if everything's labelled and people can make you know, rational decisions. So I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew.